Brand new table, brand new pin. Things are heating up on b Board Games. Let's get started. Hello and welcome back to Beetle and Board Games. Today we're diving right into Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. Game board goes in the center of the table for one to four players. You're going to use this side labeled one to four, and if you have five to six players, you'll have to use the other side with the Order and Chaos expansion. Then you want to pick a faction that you want to play with and collect the following components. You'll need a capital city board, 20 units, and eight constructs. Now these constructs are three capital city levels, three towers, and two vessels. So this will make your supply and then you want to take two serfs and one warrior into the courtyard at the top of the capital city board. Then take the three hero cards and put these to the right of the board. The two action tokens go into the courtyard. Three resource tokens which will be one ore, one mana, and one food go into the two space of the resource track. And then you want to collect a complete set of tactic cards which will be labeled X out of 7. And then you want to place the score token off the board on the one space of the score track meaning you start with a score of 0. Then take the spell cards, shuffle these, and then put these face down near the top of the game board and deal one spell card to each player, which will become their hand or a player's spell library. So these are kept secret from other players. And then take three resource tokens. So this part is pretty interesting. Now you're going to determine what will be taxed. So to do so, you're going to start dropping these resource tokens randomly from your hand. And the first one that drops will be on the four space of the tax track. The second one will be the third. And the last one goes on the two. So the youngest player starts off the game with the first player token or the game lets you determine any other way if you want to. And then each player gets to pick which continent they want to start their capital city on, starting first with the player to the right of the first player. So you put the level one capital city construct in a capital city region. And now each of these continents will only have one capital city. So basically each player starts off with their own continent. Next, you want to shuffle all these expiration tokens face down and put one brown token on any land region unless it's a swamp where you'll put two of these expression tokens. C regions will get one blue token, except for the center octopus region, which will get two C exploration tokens. Now keep in mind that for one to two players, you'll only put these tokens around three continents. And then for three to four players, you'll put them around all four. And of course, for five to six, you'll put them on all continents as well. And that's the setup. So the whole point of this game is to build and expand your army and then reach eventually one out of four objectives. Once any player reaches one of those four objectives, the game is over and then the person with the most victory points win. So now the fun part. How do you play Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea? So each round has three phases performed in order and the first phase is the action selection phase. So you're going to take one of these action tokens and then put them on an open slot across the top of your capital city board. So you have two of these tokens to use each round and once an action is picked, you can't pick it again this round unless an ability or a spell lets you. Okay, so the left actions are categorized as capital actions, which means that these can be followed by other players using serfs. So other players can now follow me if they have the recruit open and there's a serf in their courtyard. So let's say I'm the first player and I choose to recruit. Now other players can follow me if they have the recruit slot open and there's also a serf in their courtyard. All they have to do is move the serf from their courtyard to the recruit action and they don't have to perform it in turn order, so the game keeps flowing. Now the second category of actions are the command actions, where if you pick one of these, you can immediately muster a second command action, meaning you take one serve from your courtyard into another command action, so I could march, and then muster, and then cast a spell. Okay, so we have the left capital actions, where other players can follow you right away by using a surf. And the command actions on the right, where you can use one surf to basically pick two separate command actions at once. To recruit lets you play resources to recruit units at the bottom of your capital city board. So if I want to recruit a warrior, I'll have to pay two food by moving these tokens down and then take a warrior and put them on the courtyard. You can only recruit one unit at a time, but the one exception is with serfs, which you can spend three food and then recruit two serfs at once. Now, if you have one warrior in play at the end of the game, it is worth one victory point. But no one's interested in recruiting some weenie units, we want the big guns. So like certain heroes will require you to have certain buildings listed in order for them to be built. So heroes are worth two victory points at the end of the game and they all come with three levels of abilities which you can use depending on what level your capital city is. So if you have a level one capital city, then you can only use level one hero abilities. Okay, so we talked about recruiting units and heroes, now what about vessels? Both types of vessels are listed on the bottom right of the capital city board. If you decide to recruit a sea vessel, 
These stars docked on the shore of your capital city region, which is half on land and then half on water. But it is considered to be in the land region. Air vessels will start fully in the capital city region. So if you want to move units to these vessels, they just have to be in the same region and then you can put a maximum of two units in each vessel. If they are in the courtyard, they're considered to be in the capital. So then you can move them from the courtyard on the capital city board directly to a dock vessel. Action number two, building. Now the cost of all buildings are the same and they're all listed on the bottom left of the capital city board. It takes three ore and then you have to move a surf from your courtyard to this gray build icon on the level one row of the building. The thing is, if serfs are moved here, it permanently is stuck here for the rest of the game and it cannot be used for anything else. Every building is worth one strength, which we'll talk about when it comes to battling, and one victory point at the end of the game. So if you want to upgrade the capital, the cost is listed in the banner at the level two and level three rows, and then you can put up the corresponding upgrade to your capital. Upgrading capital cities gives you a lot from more towers to more spell cards, more strength and more victory points. So we talked about building a building, a capital city, and the third thing to build is a tower. A tower can be built at any place the surface is present, but it'll cost you one ore for every land region away from the capital. So in this case, it would be one, two, C doesn't count, three, and then four ores to build a tower here. Then you can reveal each token adjacent to the tower, but you can't resolve it until another unit enters those regions. But unlike building, surfs aren't stuck here and they're free to keep moving after building a tower. The tower is also worth one victory point for each land region away from the capital it is. Capital action number three, research. So the game also gives you, aside from expanding your army, access to different types of spells via the research action. Now the first one is to conjure spells by drawing three spell cards and you can choose which ones to keep and which ones to discard depending on your current hand limit. So let's say you have a level one capital city. It says here that you can only have one spell card in your spell library. If you already have one spell card and then use conjure spells, you then have to pick one card out of the four you have and then discard the other three cards. So the other action is to scribe a spell. And for this one, you take one spell card in your spell library and permanently place it face up on the scribe spell spot on the right side of your capital city board. You can only scribe spells that are labeled cast. So make sure that you pick carefully because once you scribe spells, it basically means you use them over and over again. But the downside is you can't discard it once you scribe it here. There are also two other types of spell cards that cannot be scribed. The second one is labeled combat, which you can only use during battle. And the third is labeled interrupt, which you can use immediately after an enemy player has cast a spell. And the last capital action is to tax for resources. Now all you do here is to gain the amount of resources that are listed on the tax column. And then these resources will cycle. So the token moves back down and then the other two move up. Okay, so now let's switch gears and talk about the command actions now. If you choose to march, you can move from one to five units from a single land region called an army into another land region. Now each land region can hold a maximum of five units, but there are two exceptions. One, the capital city has no limit to the amount of units that it can hold. And two, you can temporarily be over five units if your army is passing through. Now your army can be made of any combination of units, but the number of land regions that your units can move depends on the lowest speed unit. So if I have two warriors with three speed, and a paladin with one speed, I can only move one region because of the paladin in this army. So again, any units in your courtyard also means that they're in the capital. That's important because you can march your units if you want to directly from your courtyard to an adjacent region. Now towers are also considered adjacent. So as you can guess, you can take your units from your courtyard and then move them to where your tower is. Now notice here that there are two marching action slots. So that means that you can do it twice in the same round even by the same army and by using the mustering action that we talked about earlier. Okay, so we know how to move, but what happens when you stop moving? If your army ends the march in the land region that has a face down expiration token, you reveal it and resolve it right away. If you stopped in a swamp, there are two expiration tokens, so you'll have to resolve it one at a time. If you move to a desert, you have to end your march right away, even if you have enough speed to keep going. So you have to use another march in order to move out of it. Now, if you look on the main board, there are all these white dotted lines. These are ferry routes and every content is connected by them, meaning you can move your units from this content to this one if they're connected by the same ferry route. But let's say you wanna sail through adjacent regions separated by ferry routes. That's where your sea vessel comes in. So you have to use one speed to first set sail from shore to sea, another point to adjacent sea regions, and another point again to dock onto a shore. Now these corner regions are also linked, so you can sail from here to here, but you can't go diagonally. 
Any land units with a maximum of two can freely board and exit your vessel, but sea vessels cannot march with an army. Marching is separate from sailing. So a couple other things about sailing. Just like the desert regions, the center sea makes you immediately stop your sail action shown with this symbol here. So you'll have to use another separate sail action in order to move out of the center sea region. If you land here, you resolve these tokens one at a time. And if you docked with an unexplored token, you can reveal and resolve the land token too. So there's one other type of transportation which pretty much answers all the restrictions that you had from both marching and sailing, and that is flying and air vessel. You can fly through adjacent land regions and you can even keep going past deserts. You can fly across a sea, but the central sea portion still costs you two speed and you cannot land in a sea region. So if you fly into a sea region and battle a sea vessel, but if it survives, the air vessel only has one speed left in order to make it to land or else it gets destroyed and you'll have to build it all over again. Now sometimes when you're exploring land and you explore different regions with land exploration tokens, if the token requires you to lose a unit and there are no units in your vessel, then the air vessel itself gets destroyed. And the last action is to cast a spell. So to cast a spell, all you do is reveal one spell card from your hand or you can pick one of your scribe spells and then pay the mana cost on the upper left corner of the spell card. You get victory points listed on the top right corner right away. These scribe spell cards also have different states. Let me explain. When it's upright, it is in the ready position, meaning you can cast this one right away. After you cast it, you're going to rotate it upside down, meaning it has been exhausted. So during the collection phase, any spell card that's not ready rotates 90 degrees one time, counterclockwise, meaning that they're in their preparing state. So they're not ready to cast until they rotate one more time to the ready position. Finally, let's go over the best part of any board game, battling. So anytime your army or vessel moves into a region with enemy units or structures, movement ends right away and then battle begins. So the person that initiates a battle automatically gains one victory point and it's called the attacker. So you start off by having each player add up all the strengths of units, vessels, and structures in that region. Now first, you can add the natural strength of a unit. So paladins have a natural strength of four and then its ability says plus one strength if at least one serf is in his army, making it plus five strength. Now you can cast one combat spell to add strength to your army, or you can decrease strength from your enemy's army or even kill their units. Now the defender will always get to cast a combat spell first, followed by the attacker, and then the cycle ends. So let's say the defender casts a spell, and then the attacker casts a spell. The defender can't keep going and cast another one to rebuttal it, but interrupt spells can still be played. So remember in the beginning when we had seven tactic cards? Seven tactic cards. So now, after each player adds up all their total strength, they're gonna pick one of those seven tactic cards and then choose one to play. So you still have to be able to afford all costs of the card. And win or lose, you still have to pay the cost and gain victory points that are listed on the tactic card. You have to pay the cost of the tactic card if you can, but if you don't have the resources to, then the requirements on the card is ignored and it gives you zero strength. So let's say you're struggling to pay the cost of the tactic card. You can sacrifice one or more of your units by laying them on their side and then their natural strength can go towards paying the cost of the card. You cannot sacrifice vessels or structures. Now if you win by having the most strength, you stay in the region. Ties will go to the defender and if you lose, you take damage by losing units or structures whose natural strength totals at least half of the losing army's natural strength rounded up. But the losing player will get to choose which units are lost. But towers have to be the first one lost since they cannot remain in the region with enemy units and they also cannot be moved to the capital city. A couple notes, damage has to be completely assigned to one tower unit. So a couple of quick notes, damage has to be completely assigned to one tower unit or vessel first before assigning the rest of the damage. If anything takes damage at all, it is lost and returned to the supply. And now any remaining units have to be returned to the losing player's capital city or region where they have a tower. So let's say humans lost and they have six strength. So humans take three damage and then they decide to lose just the paladin which covers more than three and then that's it. The remaining two serfs return back to the capital city or the tower. So let's talk about battling with a capital city, a tower and a vessel. Now towers have a natural strength of three and remember they're considered adjacent to the capital city's courtyard. So the defending player could use the conscripts tactic to move units from the courtyard into the battle. And if the defending player loses, the tower takes damage first and then they get destroyed and returned to the supply. Now vessels can battle with or without passengers. Just make sure you add the unit strengths if there are units on board. If you decide to battle a capital city, 
you got a lot going against you. You're going to add in strength listed for the capital city's level, strength from any units in the courtyard and the action bar along with their bonuses, strength of vessels in or docked on shore of the capital city region, the strength of any serfs in any completed building worker spaces, and units that you can move from your towers to your courtyard using the conscripts tactic card. But if you manage to surpass all of that, you gain five extra victory points and the best thing in the world happens, family and friend ties say goodbye because the player's eliminated from the game. Okay, you gotta admit, that's probably like the funnest part of the game is just taking someone out from destroying the capital city. <laughs> so each player performs one action and this is cycled twice. So by the end, everyone will have performed two actions. Then you move to phase two which is the collection phase, where you will gather resources if you have at least one unit or structure in a specific region. So mountains will give you ore, forests will give you mana, and plains will give you food. The swamp, desert, and capital cities, these are not resource regions. Sometimes if you see a land region with the worker space symbol, a surf can be kept there in order to collect one additional resource from that region. And then after collecting resources, you draw one spell card from the spell deck, and if you're over your hand limit, discard until you have your hand limit. Now, scribe spells don't count towards your spell library hand limit. Now, all players return serfs and the action tokens back to the capital city's courtyard. Scribe spells get rotated, and then first player marker goes clockwise, and you start the round all over again. Okay, so to recap, phase one is where you pick one of your capital actions that can be followed by any other player, or one of the command actions that can be mustered pretty much where you double up on a turn. Then we move to the last phase, which is phase three, the end phase. You cannot untrigger the end game conditions once they've already been met even if conditions are no longer met after you trigger them. The first condition is Explore, where all land exploration tokens have been revealed. Number two is Expand, where all player serfs and warriors are in play. Number three is Exploit, where everyone's towers are in play. And the funnest one I mentioned earlier was Exterminate, where a player destroyed another player's capital city. Now you total up everyone's victory points from each unit and vessel in the game, not from the supply, for each building that you completed, build towers with one victory points for each land region away from the capital city, for the final capital city level listed on the capital city board, but no victory points at all if it remained at level one. One point for each scribe spell, one point for each region that you control at the end of the game, but not including your capital city, and bonus points from building abilities listed on the capital city board. You also get extra victory points for specific exploration tokens in controlled regions. So the most victor points will win, and ties are resolved by having the highest total resources in the game. And the winner also reads aloud the victory lore at the end of the manual. Okay. So the base game comes with humans, orcs, elves, and dwarves. So in the Order and Chaos expansion, now you can take your game to 5 to 6 players by adding in the lionkin, the undead, the lizard folk, and the goblins. So gameplay is still the same, but to set up, you'll attach the expansion board to the right side of the game board, along with the land and sea exploration tokens. If you decide to play with the undead, which I think is my personal favorite faction, you can also take the underworld card and six soul tokens. Now these you'll get if you kill serfs and wars in battle, and you have the choice to reap their soul, which will give you a bunch of different benefits, like more victory points or more strength in battle. Now there are also two mini expansions. For two players, draw a third mercenary card. So you can recruit mercenaries by taking or following a recruit action and then paying its cost, placing the mini in your courtyard, taking the corresponding card, and then each player can only have one mercenary in play at a time. They also don't require any buildings in your capital city in order to be recruited. Now some of these mercenaries can enter vessels, but others can't. It'll show on the card. If they are killed or sacrificed in battle, they return to the supply and then can be recruited again by any player. So what's different though is that you can fire your mercenary at any time and send it back to the supply. But why would you want to do this? You would do this to hire a different mercenary. Now lastly, these guys get stronger along with the tier of your capital city. The other mini expansion are Siege Engines. So you will place six of these Siege Engine Constructs and their six engine cards next to the main board. All you have to do is pay the cost of these by taking or following a build action, and then put this in your courtyard or region with your tower. Now you take the Siege Engines card, but you can only have one of each type of Siege Engine in play. Now these don't require your capital city in order to be built. Now to move Siege Engines, they only have one speed, and they have to be moved with at least one other non-siege engine unit. They cannot go into any vessels alone and they must always be in a region with at least one other non-siege engine unit. They also can be destroyed by losing in battle or by sacrificing to pay for a tactic card 
or if it's alone without another friendly unit or tower. And the final and last expansion for Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea is Pestilence. So, seven players. Now, I can't even imagine seven players around one table. Like, that'd be so much fun. So to set up for this final expansion, you'll put the continents on stilts right above the central sea region. Just make sure the orientation and the letters match. If a player decides to play as the bird folk, then they have to start on the floating continent. But if not, any player can choose to start here. Now again, you'll put land exploration tokens on this continent. And you also put two sea exploration tokens underneath it as per usual. Now what's also a really fun twist is if you play with the merfolk, you cover the continent with the sunken continent overlay screen and then place 10 sea tokens on this continent instead of the land tokens. So the merfolk, fittingly, can never start on the floating continent. So what's different about both of these continents is that for flying, it takes at least two speed to land here and you have to fly through the central sea region when coming or going there. You can still march it though by taking the ferry routes that are connected to the game board. And also, sea vessels cannot sail or dock at the floating continent. For the sunken continent, any land units can march through, build towers, and end movements on them. And air vessels can also end their flag movement on them as well. Other than that, gameplay is the same. So, that is Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea with every single expansion covered. I hope you liked that video. Hope you liked the B-roll. Hope you like all the new stuff coming to b on board games. Lots of cool, fun, crazy stuff coming to this channel. So, see you in the next one.